Renting in London keeps getting harder and harder. I've been getting loads of questions about how to rent and find flats in London. And I think because the market is so bad, um, my previous videos that I've made are not comprehensive enough. So I thought I would do a step-by-step -step of how you can find flats in London. I moved personally three times now while I'm in London in the last four years. So I think I have a fair bit of experience. I've done um, renting a flat while I was in the country to switching to a different flat while I was switching visas. So I have a good idea of the renting process after going through it a few times. So I'll be going through this step by step. First, how to determine your budget and your requirements. What different types of flats are available in London? where to find them and how to view them, and then the process of putting in an offer and getting that accepted, and then moving in, things that you need to know. So let's get started. So number one is determining your budget. So of course your budget is very personal to you and what you're comfortable spending, but typically I would say that people suggest you only spend 30% of your monthly income. Although I would have to say in London, most people spend around 50% just because of how much it costs to rent here. But of course it depends on your lifestyle and priorities. So have a think about that and how much you realistically wanna spend on your accommodations every month. But how do you translate that to what you're looking for on the market. So firstly, the thing to mention is that there's weekly and monthly rent here. In Canada, we never had this, so this was very new to me. So I thought I would just explain it in case. So weekly is pretty straightforward, is how much you pay per week. But then most people pay rent by the month. And month is not simply um, like your weekly times four or weekly times five. It's actually the weekly amount times 52 divided by 12 to get the exact monthly number. And this is important to know because your deposit will be five weeks. So you kind of need to know the weekly and the monthly amount. There's gonna be cases where you see both so it's important to know how to calculate either. But of course your rent isn't the only expense that you're gonna have when you're renting. There's gonna be other fixed costs that will add to what you would need to include in your budget. So for example, if your budget is max 1,500, you actually can't be just looking for flats that are 1,500 or under. You'll have to look a little bit beneath that to account for the utilities and bills. So what exactly are the costs that you'll have to add? The first thing that was a surprise to me is council tax. So council tax is kind of like you're paying for the local services provided in your area. Um, and this can vary depending on which area that you live in. And it also varies based on the value of your property. So there are different bands that your property can fall under and that will be a different monthly payment. I'll put a chart up here showing that the different bands. And this also increases usually every year. However, you can get a discount on this if you're living alone. You can get a 25% discount if you're renting by yourself, but usually on the listing, it'll say what council band they're on, and then you can check for that year what is that yearly payment and divide it by 12 because it'll be paid on a monthly basis. Next is utilities, which is water, gas, and electric. Some places I've seen do, do include water, but it is quite rare, I would say, and this varies a lot depending on where you live and your building. So this is definitely one to watch out for if you're in an older building building. Older buildings tend to have a higher utilities fee just because they're not as built um, sustainably and like the just like the walls are thinner, it lets out more heat during the winter so you're gonna have to use more heating. Um, I would ask the resident of the viewing that you're at what their typical utilities fees are um, to get a better picture. But typically for utilities, I would budget at least 100 pounds a month. And then lastly, usually Wi-Fi is not included, so you'll have to account for some Wi-Fi costs, which is usually around 20-ish pounds. So if we look at that original example I gave where you had the max budget of 1,500, if you deduct you know, council tax, utilities, and Wi-Fi costs, you are actually looking closer to 1,280 per month is your max. This is important to know upfront because even if you look at this number, you're like, okay, actually, I'm not gonna find anything I like within that price range. I'm gonna increase the amount of my monthly um, salary that I'm gonna spend on rent. Um, it's also important to know to know how much you need to save in order to put down an offer for this property. So some additional costs you'll need to take into consideration is that you're gonna have to pay, of course, the first month rent upfront, and of course, five weeks of deposit. This is like pretty standard. And if you're a student and you do not have a guarantor, or if you are an international 
um, expat and you don't have a guarantor and you don't have a job right now, um, then you'll need to pay usually six months up front. That is actually the initial contract I signed when I first got here. It's quite standard to ask you to pay six months up front and then at the four month mark, they'll ask you to pay another six months. Or you have a job, then that that's fine. But um, if not, then you might need to have more in savings in order to secure the flat that you like. Before we continue, I'd like to thank Amber for sponsoring this video. They're a platform dedicated to helping students find accommodations. I know it can be particularly hard for students to find accommodations because a lot of landlords do prefer um, an older working adult and also a lot of these universities are located in the city centers so making it even more difficult to find an accommodation close by. Amber makes it so easy for students to find their accommodations. You can search by your preferences, where you're going to be living or where you want to live, or even the university that you'll be attending. So you can just filter for accommodations near that. They have over a million beds available on the website from um, shared dorms to en suites to private rooms. So there is bound to be something for everyone. Their accommodations are conveniently located close to major universities and also in city centers. Best of all, the prices on the Amber website includes all utilities so there are no hidden charges and fees and you don't have to worry about the extra costs that I talked about earlier. If you want to give Amber a try, click the link in my description. Booking is super easy. You just have to find the accommodation that you're interested in, send an inquiry in, and then one of their booking executives will be in touch to finalize and do any of the necessary paperwork and prepare you for move in. Amber is also offering 50 pounds cash back to my viewers so if you use the link in my description you'll get 50 pounds cash back on your booking. Thanks again, Amber, for sponsoring this video. So now you have an idea of your budget, let's consider your requirement. So I have a list of things that you'll need to consider. So one, how many rooms are you looking for? Are you looking for a flat share? Like now that you know your budget, is it more realistic for you to get a flat share versus um, a studio, a one bed, a two bed, or would it be, do you have a friend that you can share a two bed with? Because that actually brings out the cost quite a lot as well. So that's some options to consider. Do you want to share? Do you want to live alone? Um, studio size okay with you? Or do you want a one bedroom? Do you want a living room? Um, these are all things that you can think about. The other thing is like the different types of flats that are available and there's pros and cons to each of course so i would say that there is three main types of flats that are quite common in london the first one is a terraced house so in canada we would call it probably like a townhouse so there's like houses that are a little bit more skinny and they're all kind of like next to each other in a row um, but each floor is probably a different flat or sometimes if the building's bigger there might be two flats per floor and they've been all um, separated out and these tend to be older and a little bit more rundown but of course it kind of depends on the landlord and like how much they've taken care of or done any renovations to it but this type of flat is very common in London the next one is like a flat in a building but like an older building so not like a new uh, condominium perhaps but just like an old building in London. These are common as well. I would say generally they're not as nice. They're definitely not as nice as a new build. And then lastly, of course, we have new builds. So these are kind of in the more uh, neighborhoods that are getting gentrified a bit or in developing areas. And these are kind of like the nice shiny flats that you would see in America or in Toronto. And they tend to be a little bit more expensive because they're a commodity here in London. So you can have a think about whether you want something modern and new or do you prefer like an older style building because I know when I first moved here I did have a romance of living in like an older Terrence house um, in like Notting Hill or something obviously most of the Terrence houses here are not like that but I did live in one just before I moved here and it was it was cute it was cute but I realized you know what that's not for me <laughs> I actually prefer the new builds and everything to be functioning properly another one is are you looking for outdoor space I would say that is a luxury here in London but there there are quite a few flats with um, a back garden or um, a balcony, so it is not impossible, but it is definitely going to make the property more expensive if you have any sort of outdoor space. What part of London do you want to live in? So I already have a really detailed video covering basically all the areas in zone one and zone two that are popular to live in. I'll link that video here. It's been pretty well loved. So I think um, if you're looking or have no idea of what area to live in, it'll be super helpful for you. 
Another question to consider is how important different transport links are to you. So um, there are some areas that only have overground stations, for example, or certain lines of the tube or are only accessible through buses. So how important that is that to you? I would consider where you work, where you're going to go often and find a tube line or an overground line that crosses easily with that area um, if you're not aiming to live in that area. So when I moved to this current place, I considered that even though this is super far from my work like basically on the opposite end of the city I'm on a line that basically brings me to work equally as fast as when I lived closer just because before I used to have to walk 20 minutes to an overground station and then had to take that overground for another 20 minutes and now that I just take one line is actually the same amount of time it's definitely super important to consider especially if you're going to be taking it every day to work next is are you going to have a pet or do you already have a pet because having a pet definitely makes it much more difficult to find a flat in London I think in Toronto they introduce rules where you cannot say that you're not allowed a pet if the building allows a pet but now in London, um, landlords can make up those stipulations. So I would say it's very difficult since most people prefer um, not to have pets in their flats. If you're looking for something higher budget, I would say that's probably less of an issue because they're more accommodating, but definitely something to be aware of when you're looking for flats. And then lastly, how long are you looking to rent for? In London, I would say 12 month is pretty standard. That's like what they would consider long term, but I've seen flats that request for 24 months. Um, and then I seen some short term ones for six months or three months. So have a think about what you're comfortable with, whether you're looking for something more temporary or you want to at least stay there. There's like benefits to both where like my friend had a 24 month rent. So she was able to lock in her two bedroom flat for a cheaper price when the market wasn't so hot. So that was in her benefit. And then um, otherwise it's like you might want to test out the area and live there for six months and then leave. And then also some flat shares are quite accommodating with month to month. That's potentially a fine, but I would say it's a little bit more rare. Most people will require at least six months. Okay, now that you know your budget and generally what you're looking for or what you prefer, here are some ways to find a flat. So first, of course, there are tons of online platforms, but here are the most popular ones. So I would say Rightmove, Zoopla, and On The Market are the most popular rental platforms. I would say they're quite similar. I personally prefer Rightmove, maybe just the interface, and I also feel like it is the most popular one, but they all have pretty similar listings. And on there, you're mostly gonna be finding kind of like whole flats for rent. There are gonna be some flat shares here and there, but it's definitely not the platform for it. And then you'll also find some individual landlords as well that are not with agencies because they also scrape from open rent, which is another platform that's for individual landlords that are listing their own flats. Um, so those are not with an agency and you'll be signing a private kind of like contract with them. I'll talk about that more in a bit of which is preferable. And then there is spare room if you're looking for roommates. And that is, I think one of the most popular platforms to find a roommates. Now those platforms are all great to search, but there are some few other methods that I want to share that might help you land a property because all those platforms are quite widely used. So the first one is going straight to the agency. So of course, all these agencies, they list their properties on the platforms, but there's are oftentimes properties that are about to come on the market or haven't yet been posted yet that they shop around even before they put it live or it never gets put live. So once you have an idea of what area that you wanna live in, I would search up real estate agency and look at the ones that are available in that area and give them a call or go in person um, and just be tell them what you're looking for and they might know of a property that will come onto the market soon or is available now that they just haven't posted yet and a lot of the times you would think oh the landlord wants to put it on the market and get people to um, bid for prices or something but sometimes that is not the case the landlord has a price already in mind and they are willing to rent it out at anyone that can agree to that price or you, there might even be room for negotiation um, but yeah that is a quite a good way to find property that's not yet on the market and get in there early. Another one is contacting property management companies that are built to rent. So there are a lot of buildings actually in London, especially in the kind of like a little bit 
on the outskirts in like zone two where there's a lot of new developments there's a lot of property companies that have built buildings just to rent and um, they are available you can sometimes see them on right move but they'll typically list one or two listings and but actually the whole building is available so once you see a listing like that um, that says built to rent you can inquire and be like okay what else do you have available and sometimes actually a lot of the times they'll have offers such as like one month free but these buildings Buildings tend to be a little bit more expensive because they are all new builds. Now, lastly, this kind of goes with open rent, but Facebook Marketplace or any Facebook groups, I would say uh, be extremely, extremely careful when you try and rent on Facebook Marketplace or with private landlords, just because unless you are able to go see it in person and verify that they are the owner, there has been many scams happening in London. So if something is too good to be true, I would trust your gut. I would say definitely going with an agency is generally safer. You have a standardized contract, but you have to also realize the landlord is paying the agents for that service. So um, they definitely are pricing things a little bit higher, accounting for the fees that they have to pay this agency. Versus with a landlord, you might be more likely to get a better deal, but um, the legal protections are a bit less if you have things like maintenance um, issues. Um, you have to really look at the landlord's character or really detailed when you view the flat. So I would say there's benefits to both. There's no harm in checking out a place that is listed on open rent, for example. But in that case, I would say have kind of like an interview with the landlord, obviously, and see, try to suss out if you think that um, they're a good landlord. Another thing I forgot to mention with these platforms is at least at the current time, the market is so hot, you kind of need to be checking it maybe three, four, five times a day. Honestly, as soon as something hits the market, it could be gone that day or the next day. So as soon as you see something you like, inquire right away, try to book in a viewing right away because everything goes so fast now, especially for obviously desirable properties, like the ones that are quite nice. So speed is definitely a factor here. Okay, now you found a property that you like, you are going to view it. What do you need to watch out for? So I'm gonna go through a list of the things that I now watch out for just based on the, my experience with my previous flat, which wasn't in the best condition. And of course, this can be personal to you and what you're particular about, but there are some things that are just not things to even consider in Canada that now I realize I need to consider when I look for a flat here. So one, what floor is it on? I would advise people to stay away from sub-ground flats just because of how much it rains here. Sub-ground flats in London tend to be really damp and cold. So with the weather the way it is, it's just really depressing and um, you're kind of more susceptible to mold and things like that um, living in a sub-ground flat. So that is definitely something I don't even go for when I see that a flat is sub-ground. And a lot of these Terrence houses, they will have a sub-ground flat. Um, in some, it might be okay because actually like from the front level it looks subground with and then from the back is actually on the ground level because it's like on a hill or something so there could be some exceptions i generally do not prefer subground flats and then in the flat there are these are some things that i watch out for so the floor condition i never really cared about floor condition but in my last one there was really old crickety veneer floors that were slightly like curved and that actually makes it really difficult to put furniture and or like if you have a desk chair, it, my desk chair used to always kind of roll towards the right a tiny bit. So just something to watch out for um, if you're visiting an older flat. Um, the furniture conditions. So a lot of flats you're going to find are going to come furnished. And a lot of this furnishing, if you're looking at an older flat, is quite old. So it's more like, can you tolerate this furniture condition? And do you need to negotiate with the landlord to, to have it removed or replaced? Um, so definitely watch out for the furniture furniture condition because it might be yours to use. So in my last flat, there was a room that was facing more, I want to say north, but it got really good lighting. And then the other room facing next, this is probably more important than lighting, but the glazing of the windows. So a lot of these older flats will not have double glazed windows. And this is important because it really um, insulates the apartment. So more heat will escape. You're going to be having to pay more utilities costs in the winter, which is not cheap. Um, so definitely something to watch out for. And you can ask if the windows are single glazed, double glazed, or triple glazed. In newer flats, this is not really an issue, but in older flats, like 
the one I lived at before that had like a window that went up like this. It was definitely a single glazed window and I used to feel a little bit of a draft coming from it actually. Um, next is to watch for any damp or mold just because, you know, it's a rainy place in London. Um, you can kind of either look for it or see if there's a smell of it. Um, definitely also testing the water pressure uh, of the taps. If that's good for you, that is definitely something kind of difficult to fix or like honestly trying to get them to meet maintenance things um, after you sign the lease is going to be difficult so it would probably be best to be in the condition that you wanted in when you go to view it check for storage i never realized how important storage was until my last fat as well because there was no wardrobe there was really only one um, big storage area by the door, but even like you don't you realize like oh, where am I gonna put my suitcases? Um, you think you don't have that much stuff But it's like all these like places to just put your random stuff and hide it away is super important and store Just like a commodity in London So check that there aren't enough cupboards and wardrobes places to put your clothes Suitcases um, random things that you need to put away and out of sight any cracks Maybe cracks in the walls or cracks in the floors that might be concerning um, checking all the lighting, does all the lighting work? And also the appliances, do they work? Like, of course, these kind of like bigger issues will be solved when you moved in, but it is kind of annoying um, to deal with. And then also like the noise level, um, if you can hear your neighbors, is the street outside really, really loud? Um, if you have single blaze windows and a really loud street, like on, I don't know, the high street of Hackney, it's gonna be not a fun time if you're trying to sleep in, or not sleep in, but like on a Friday night go to sleep early or something like that. So uh, these are all personal preferences, but things to watch out for if you're viewing a flat. Next, let's say you you pass all that. You picked out your perfect flat. Um, you're like, yes, I want this one. How does the offer process go? So in, in my experience of working with an agent, there's been two ways. One, which was just like a verbal back and forth was a pricing. I told my agent what I wanted to pay. They told the landlord, they went back and forth a bit, came back to me back and forth. We all agreed on a pricing and then basically it was settled and I basically just went on to the referencing credit check process. But I think the more common way is that a lot of agencies will have an application form that you fill out after your viewing, staying, stating your information, um, roughly what you get paid and what your offering is. And then they'll take a look at all the applications and choose to whether like go back to you on the pricing or accept your offer. So once your offer is accepted, which just basically means that you agree on the price, you will pay a one week deposit at that point to take it off the market. So when you first give the offer in and they accept it, at that point you can still be like, no, I don't want it. But now that you're putting a deposit in to be like, hey, I am agreeing to rent your flat, and letting you do all the checks, um, that costs money for the agency. So if you choose not to rent the flat after the checks, you will lose your deposit of one week, which is not like the end of the world, but why do that? <laughs> um, so you give the one week deposit, and then during that time, they'll conduct the credit checks, the reference checks, um, and then your right to rent check. So credit check, pretty standard, I think, in everywhere in the world, they check your credit. The references, I actually don't think I ever had any of my references called. Actually, I lie. I remembered for my employer references, they were actually quite detailed where they sent them a form to fill out and answer a few questions to prove what I was saying was correct about my income and my ability to like work in the UK. And then for my second one, um, I had to put a landlord reference and I put my previous agency down. And I'm not 100% sure if they contacted them all, but I think they might have because this is all mostly done through a third party platform. So they can complete it kind of like a checklist. And then the right to rent. So that is important if you are not a citizen. This is something you can prove through a website. So on the website, you enter your information and then it will basically create a code for them to check your right to rent and when you're eligible towards. So this was super important when I was switching visas because when I gave them my share code, it said my visa was almost expiring, but I was in the mid application process for a new visa. So they legally could not rent to me until my new visa was approved. So yeah, very important to know your end date of your visa and if you need to get another one before you like renew your rent, for example, or try to rent a new place. But let's say if you don't pass one of those checks, you will actually lose the deposit. So make sure you have all your ducks in a row before you pay that initial one week deposit. Now, once all the checks are passed, this is when you're gonna sign your tenancy agreement, you send in your deposit and also first month rent. 
you are now ready to move in. So actually the first thing I think you need to do is set up your Wi-Fi <laughs> because here setting up a Wi-Fi takes minimum two weeks. <laughs> Unless you are using the, ex even actually if you're using the exact same provider, they need to send someone out to set it up for you and that In the first flat that I lived in, the, um, the previous tenant left behind the hyper optic modem. So then I didn't have to get someone to sign out. I literally called and could activate the service within like, I think two days. But um, for my next flat after that, it w when I went to book the appointment, I could only book it for two weeks out. And it's quite standard from what I've heard to take two weeks to get your Wi-Fi set up. So as soon as you know when you're going to move in, um, I would call and set up the Wi-Fi uh, guy to come as soon as possible at or the move in date that you have, actually. Next is the day you're going to move in, there is going to be an inventory check or it might happen um, a few days before. So as soon as the other tenant moves out, there'll probably be an inventory check. Um, typically they do this with you, but I've had a case where I couldn't make it. So they did it without me and then they gave me seven days to check over the flat. I think either way you get seven days to like um, dispute anything in the inventory. And in this inventory, in my experience, they've been extremely detailed with it, was like taking photos of any dents anywhere conditions of like the appliances that are pre-existing that might be of concern um, like a chip on a bed or like anything like that they take a picture of not that if you cause that kind of damage you will need to pay for it um, but it is up to the landlord discretion so they take a picture of everything the condition of the door uh, just just basically everything and then when you move in you need to take that inventory list and check that everything that they mentioned is there and then some like is there anything that you think they might accuse you of in the flat that you might pay for because they basically expect you to return the property in the exact same condition but this is super important to make sure that at the end of your tenancy there isn't any like major disputes or at least that you have proof when you move out and then lastly setting up the bills that i mentioned i would say you don't have to be in such a rush to do this i thought you had to like set, set it up the minute that like you got into the flat so you can start paying the bill immediately it's not really quite like that you could take a week or two um to set it up basically the previous tenant would have already put the, the date that they're moving out if there's a gap i think that's the landlord's responsibility sometimes the agent will set you up on the utilities but i would say most of the time you have to set it up yourself so you'll ask them what company that the the um, property uses and then you'll go to their website and basically there will always be an option that says moving in and you put your details in the day that you're you moved in from and then it will calculate your bill from that day if you get any bills from that point that are before your time do not pay them they are not your responsibility um, you might get them because of course you love that that address now but I did have a case where the previous tenant I think didn't pay the last little bit like it's nothing major um, I think they probably just missed it but I emailed the agents and they were like oh don't don't worry about that that should be like the previous tenant will be paying that um, so yeah just something to watch out for you can take your time to set it up in the first week or two like of course it's just gonna occur you take more time to set it up and now your place should be ready for you to live in okay i think i covered everything from looking for a flat to moving in if i miss anything or if you have any additional questions please leave it for me in the comments i'm also thinking of starting a newsletter um if i have that set up i'll leave it in the comments or in the description for you guys to sign up but i'm basically thinking about sending out tips and like short content um, that I don't really get a chance to mention in my vlogs or these videos because these are pretty like high effort productions and it feels like it has to be, you know, like a big topic. Um, but I might answer any of your questions that you leave in the comments there. And also if you just want to stay in touch with, um, things that are going on my, in my life or like things that are going around in London, but I think I'll have that ready. So I'll leave it in the description or comments for you guys to subscribe if you're interested. Anywho, I hope this was helpful. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. It helps my channel a lot. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.